Daniel, thank you very much. Um, I'd be really interested to know how much of that anybody really disagreed with in their gut, deep down, felt a sense of abhorrence that such <coughs> spectacularly unorthodox views are being laid in front of you. But whether you really just thought, yeah. Because the question, Bain or Boone, is a difficult one, because quite obviously economic growth is both. Has provided massive benefits for humankind. We're really not going to be arguing about that tonight, Daniel. Just rest easy. I'm not going to have an argument with you about life expectancy, about improvements in health and education, quality of life, even the benefits of stuff. And if you want to get fixated about flat screen TVs, you get fixated. That's fine. I don't want to do any of that tonight. Let's bank all of that as the boon that economic growth has unfolded in the lives of very large numbers of human beings pretty much since the start of the Industrial Revolution. End of story. We're at one. You then briefly refer to a couple of problems that have occurred as a consequence of that. And there are indeed a couple of problems. One of them, you said, was poverty. Obviously, I do rather agree with you on that score. But you're right. It is not actually down to growth itself that we still have completely unacceptable levels of poverty in the world today. That is not an inherent function of growth. It is a function of fantastically dysfunctional, despicable political processes which have allowed growth to be so poorly distributed that essentially we have an elite of around a billion who take the lion's share of the growth that is generated. We then have another category of about three billion who are aspiring to get onto that treadmill as fast as they possibly can with a flat screen TV in every room. And you have about three billion for whom growth has produced very few benefits indeed, relative to the way we see it today. So I'm not going to pin that continuing poverty on growth itself, because that isn't really the case. It's actually the case that a really disgusting school of economic orthodoxy that came in through the likes of Ayn Rand and the neoliberals in the Chicago school have taken over our brains for the last 40 years and allowed us to think that that maldistribution of wealth, of growth, is a really smart thing for the planet. So we may not be in agreement on the orthodoxy of economics, but we're certainly in agreement that poverty is a problem that we have to deal with. You then very quickly whizzed over a few environmental issues, which I thought was <coughs> perhaps not fulsome in your recognition of these environmental problems. And I'll come on to climate change in a moment. Right now, in Nagoya, in Japan, a gathering of world leaders and a huge number of the world's scientists are looking at what the full extent of 50 to 60 years of untrammeled, growth-driven expansion has been on nature, on the natural world. And as you will know, during the course of that time, we've pretty much set in train what many scientists describe as the sixth extinction with levels of extinction now between 100 and 1,000 times greater than the normal rates of extinction. Now, this is a massive damage, it, if you like, on the natural world. Fascinated in Daniel's philosophical distinction between domination and damage. You are right, theoretically, that domination does not necessarily have to lead to degradation and damage. I'd be really interested to know if you think that domination theory has got away without damaging the natural world. Because if I was to take you through what is going on today in terms of forests, soil, water, fisheries, every single principal biome in the world today, I think we'd be here all week doing a full invent inventory of the damage done, okay? All week. So these are not just some piddling little externalities that have been caused because people didn't manage the growth process properly. This is a massive systemic hit on the life support systems on which we all depend. Climate change has brought that to our attention more forcefully than anything else, largely because it has established for the first time a physical, a biophysical limit on what we as a species can actually do. There have been lots of other limits, by the way, but we've ignored them. But now we've got in our mind a limit. And all the world leaders at Copenhagen last year, although it was indeed a fiasco, signed up to what this limit is. 
that the average temperature increase during the rest of this century should not exceed two degrees centigrade. That's what they've all signed up. That's the deal. And once you accept that upper threshold, beyond which lies runaway climate change, all sorts of really seriously unpleasant stuff, and below which lies a 50-50 bet that we will actually have a stable enough climate to enjoy the kind of prosperity that Daniel's talking about. This is a very tough limit to live with. This is not going to be easy. But it has helped us to understand that what growth we have now is going to have to generate increased prosperity within that overarching envelope, within that limitation. And if we step outside that envelope and continue to do business as usual growth as we do it today, then we will be guilty of the worst crime, not only against this generation, but against all generations to come. Now, Daniel does not like the concept of limits. He is essentially a born-again cornucopian for whom economic growth allows one to postulate fantasies of permanent expansion indefinitely into the future. That's what the book is essentially all about. So you mean it's a very unwise fantasy to hold, because the planet doesn't really work on fantasy. The planet works on our empirical understanding of how these natural systems actually <coughs> deliver the goods that enable us to prosper off the back of those systems. So to end, let me just tell you what this looks like in terms of generating prosperity within a low-carbon world. Daniel and I probably agree on a lot of things. We probably agree the world's population in 2050 will be about 9 billion. Daniel thinks that's a big tick. He'd probably like to have 12 billion because that would be better for prosperity. I'd like to have 8 billion. But there we are. We'll probably settle for 9 billion by 2050. We'd probably like to see all the Millennium Development Goals delivered because we both really care about poverty and humanitarian solutions to the world's problems. And Although I'm slightly less enthusiastic about this than Daniel, we'd probably accept, given the real politique of how we live today, that the rich world is going to want to carry on growing. It's not content with the idea of not growing. So the likelihood is that rich world countries will continue to grow, maybe at 2% per annum, piddling, but you know, better than nothing. We'd be lucky, wouldn't we, really? And world leaders have signed off on reducing emissions of CO2 by 50% by 2050. So 9 billion people, MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, sorted, 2% growth in the rich world, 50% reduction in CO2 by 2050. That's our reality. So, now celebrate what that looks like in terms of deploying the technologies we need to get to that point. The carbon intensity of the global economy today is 768 grams of CO2 equivalent per dollar of value created. To hit those four goals, we have to go from 768 grams to six. That's what it means. That's what the low carbon journey looks like. We have to move from 768 to 6. Now, if we try and do that through conventional economic growth, the system just implodes, which is why we have to look at very different ways of generating prosperity than relying on consumption-driven economic growth. Thank you. Thank you very much.